Hi, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for being here tonight. My name is Carolyn Roberts, and I'm the Observatory Manager and Astronomy Laboratory Coordinator here at the University of Iowa. And tonight, it is my great pleasure to introduce some of the folks who are bringing this Apollo talk tonight a lot. Our first uh, person, and you know, one of the big stars in the night, is Nancy Atkinson. She's a science journalist with the Universe Today. She's written for Space.com and Wired. She published her first book, Incredible Stories from Space, in 2016. And her most recent book, Eight Years to the Moon, was published this summer, in time for the 50th anniversary of the Apollo landing. She travels to us from Minnesota to speak with us and talk about the history that led to her latest publication. Um, tonight, she will be selling copies of her book. If anyone is interested, she'll be in the back of the room at the end of the night. Um, please welcome Nancy Atkinson. Transfixed 
And this definitely had a, a, an effect on the rest of my life because I've always been interested in space exploration. So I've been a science journalist for the past 20 years and writing about space exploration and astronomy. And part of my job is to, I get the chance to talk to scientists and engineers and astronauts. And I get to go watch rockets launch. I mean, I think I have the best job in the world. So um, I've written a book about NASA's robotic missions. Uh, it came out in 2016. And uh, about well, a little over two years ago, my publisher said that they would like to do another book with me. And so we tossed around a few ideas. And somehow it came out that the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landing was coming up in 2019. And the publisher stopped me right there and said, that's what you're going to write about. And at first, I was like so excited because here was my childhood inspiration. And I was going to get to write a book about it. But when I started doing a little research about what had already been written about Apollo, uh, I soon realized this was going to be a daunting challenge because of the Apollo program, and, and in particular, the Apollo 11 mission is one of the most well-documented events in the 20th century. There are already hundreds of books about Apollo. There are dozens of documentaries. Maybe you've seen some of them uh, this summer. PBS had a great series of the Apollo, uh, Apollo missions to the moon. And there are also some popular films. First Man was out last, last uh, fall, um, Apollo 13. There's been a lot of popular movies. So, I knew that I had to do something different than what had been done before, because most of the books that are out, they focus on the stories about astronauts, which, I mean, who doesn't love astronaut stories? I sure do. And, or they talk about the politicians, or uh, the leaders at NASA, or you know the te technological things, like the big Saturn V rocket. Or the people in mission control, they are perhaps the most visible of the people who worked on the ground. But there's one fact that a lot of people don't know about Apollo, is that it took the efforts of over 400,000 people across the country and around the world to make the Apollo missions to the moon possible. These are people that not only worked at NASA, but also at contractor companies around the, around the country, building all the various parts, components, everything that was needed, down to the specialized nuts and bolts that could withstand the rigors of space exploration. So I knew with 400,000 people working on Apollo, there had to be some untold stories out there. The challenge, though, was in finding some of these people. So I have one person in particular to thank, and his name is Norm Chaffee, and he's a, a chemical engineer for NASA, or he used to be, he's retired now. Uh, on, the, on the left there is Norm when he started at NASA in 1962. And on the right is me and Norm together in Houston last year when I went down to visit him and to do some interviews. And as you can tell, he's one of the most adorable eight-year-olds I've ever had a chance to meet. He's really great. So, um, you know, my usual mode of operation as a journalist is I call the media relations at, at Johnson Space Center or one of the other NASA centers and tell them I'd like to interview you know, somebody who worked on this mission or that mission. Well, I called them and said I wanted to talk to people about Apollo. And they said, well, those people, you know, they're all retired. This happened over 50 years ago. They are either retired or they moved on. We really can't help you. Well, I heard there was an organization called the NASA Alumni League. And I got in touch with Norm, who's active in that. And I talked to him on the phone, and once he understood what I wanted to do, to tell the stories that hadn't been told about Apollo before, Norm swung into action. So he asked if I could come down to Houston, and he reserved a room in a conference center, and he set up two full days of back-to-back -back interviews. And I just sat in that room, and people came in and told me their stories. It was amazing. And not only did they tell me their stories, they brought in pictures pictures of them at work or pictures of the components or systems that they worked on. They brought in some of the tools that they used during the, in, in their work. Or they brought in documentation or papers they had written about their work. It was just, it was just wonderful. 
And, uh, and then I also, through the course of, of my two year uh, writing this book, I talked to a total of about a little over 40 people. The rest were full interviews. And then to kind of round out the story of, of Apollo, I, I, had, I had to do some uh, oral histories that NASA has. They have a wonderful collection of oral histories uh, for the people who are no longer with us. Again, since this, is, this happened over 50 years ago, um, some of these people have passed away, unfortunately. So I used about 20 oral histories and my 40 interviews and so I tell the story of the Apollo program through the eyes and experiences of these 60 people. Really telling the stories that haven't been told before, giving the people who haven't had a chance to tell their stories an opportunity to do so. Norm worked on thrusters for the Apollo spacecraft. So you're probably all familiar with the, the the large Saturn V rocket that launched us to the moon, but also, just as important, were the very small, tiny thrusters on the outside of the Apollo spacecraft that allowed them to maneuver very precisely in space to get exactly where they needed to go. So this is a, a, a zoomed-in view of what the thrusters look like, and you can see them on the side of the, of the Apollo Command and Service Module there, and there's a set of four of them around the perimeter of the outside of the spacecraft. These thrusters are just one example of the problems, challenges, and hurdles that almost everyone who worked on Apollo encountered. When they were developing these thrusters, they had to test them on the ground before they would fly them into space. And so they put them in a vacuum chamber in very, in very cold temperatures to simulate the conditions that the thrusters would be firing in, in space. These thrusters started blowing up. At one point, Norm and his team thought they were going to blow up a building. Another point, they thought they were going to take out part of Houston. It was just a, a problem that lasted for about a year and a half. They did all sorts of tests. They built plexiglass thrusters so they could see what was happening as the thrusters were firing. Finally, they figured it out. Uh, when the thrusters didn't fire constantly, which when you're in space, they only need to uh, thrust occasionally, if, if they would cool down, some gunk would start to form on the interior, and once that gunk reached a critical mass, it would blow up. So they, all they had to do was put a little tiny heater in there, and the Apollo thrusters worked perfectly for the entire uh, Apollo program. So, like I said, every, almost every system that Apollo, that was built for Apollo, encountered problems like this. So if this was so hard and difficult, why were we trying to go to the moon in the first place? Well, it was all part of politics, in the word politics. So the space race, as it was called, the race to get into space, was became part of the Cold War, which was a confrontation between the US and the Soviet Union it never came to blows, thankfully, but it was, uh, we were all, people who lived in that era always kind of felt under the threat of nuclear war. And the space race was kind of a, a way to show dominance of what country was better and what system of governance was better, communism or democracy. And what better way to show dominance than to launch a gigantic rocket into the unknown space? But in this space race, it seemed that at every leg of the race, in the very beginning, the Soviet Union came in first. So in 1957, they launched the first satellite in space. And in 1961, they launched the first human in space. They just kept making milestone after milestone while the US kind of came well behind. And it was after Yuri Gagarin's flight that President John Kennedy approached NASA and he said, is there something that we could meet the Soviet Union at in space? And a few engineers had been looking at possible things that we could do in space, destinations. They thought this was all going to be very long term, far off into the future. And they said, well, we've been looking at the possibility of going to the moon. And we don't think the Soviet Union has, has looked at into that yet, so we could probably meet them to the moon. Now, there are a few more details to that conversation than that, but that's basically 
how we ended up going to the moon. And so just a few weeks after Alan Shepard flew in space, the first American to fly in space, President Kennedy spoke to Congress and he said that I believe that this nation should commit itself to, to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning it safely. It was met, actually, with a lot of enthusiasm. People thought it would be a great, a great challenge. People were excited about space exploration, especially after Alan Shepard's successful flight. But Shepard's flight was 15 minutes long, and it was only a suborbital flight. It didn't even go into orbit around Earth. So Kennedy challenged us to go to the moon after we had 15 minutes of space flight. And we didn't have anything of what we needed to get to the moon. We didn't have rockets big enough. We didn't have the spacecraft capable of getting to the moon and landing on the moon. We didn't have a computer. I mean, computers were the size of rooms in the early 1960s. How are you gonna get one small enough to fit inside of a spacecraft? We didn't have things like life support systems that could keep people alive in space for weeks at a time, for, for a week even. We didn't have communication systems. Uh, Trying to talk around the world was a huge challenge. Now we were going to try to communicate with a spacecraft going 240,000 miles away, plus land on the moon, plus have a TV show live from the moon. So, how did we do this? How did NASA do this in just eight years? Well, that army of 400,000 people that I talked about, it's like they just willed it to happen. They were all so dedicated and just really wanted to meet that goal that President Kennedy set. It was, um, it, was as each, it was as if each of them took it upon themselves to say, if this thing fails, it's not going to be because of me. They worked hard. They worked incredibly long hours. 60 to 70 hours a week was not uncommon. Six to seven days a week. They, they made a lot of sacrifices. Their family life suffered. Their marriages suffered. Many marriages failed. But yet a lot of them told me that this was one of the most fulfilling parts of their career. Every day, while going to work, while it was such a challenge, it was also an adrenaline rush. And then with the successes, it was just an amazing time to be alive. And so uh, I'd like to introduce you to just a few of the people that I got the chance to interview. Um, I, I got to tell the story of two of the very few women engineers at NASA. Uh, one of them is named Dottie Lee, and she helped work on the heat shield for Apollo. She, the heat shield is the part that protects the command module as it comes back to Earth. It can reach temperatures of uh, uh, two to 3,000 degrees, and you have to keep the interior of the spacecraft a nice, cozy 70 degrees uh, to keep the astronauts comfortable. Kathy Osgood was part of the rendezvous team. Rendezvous is when you bring two spacecraft together in space, and it's very, flying in space is very non-intuitive. You can't just floor it and step on the gas and, and meet up with another spacecraft. You have to do it almost in kind of a well-choreographed ballet. And Kathy was part of the team that figured that out. Now, these two women were started out as Na at NASA as human computers, a term which you may be familiar with from the movie Hidden Figures in the book that came out a couple of years ago. So they started out as computers who calculated the tra trajectory uh, for launch and reentry and all of the, the math that was needed. And uh, but they were so gifted. They were such gifted mathematicians that. They kind of grew into their jobs as engineers. And so uh, they, they worked the long hours just like their male counterparts. But uh, as women of the early 1960s were expected to do, they also were expected to take care of the domestic duties at home, for arranging childcare, um, expected to wear dress and heels every day. So their lives were, were busy and, and especially challenging. Another person that I interviewed, is, um, his name is Earl Kyle, and he worked as an engineer at Honeywell. So he's an example of one of the people that worked at the contract companies. 
he worked on developing some <coughs> communication systems and uh, navigation systems. Earl's story is interesting because he's one of the few African American engineers in the 1960s. And actually, he's, he's mixed race. His dad was black and his mom was white. And when he was growing up in the 1940s and 50s, that in Minneapolis, that was almost scandalous. So his, his childhood was, was interesting, but he was so captivated by that idea of space flight that he did everything that he could to, uh, to be part of, of America's uh, uh, missions to space. Another person that I talked to is named Dick Post, and he's here with us tonight. So when I started writing about the book, I was so interested to find out about the simulations. I think we're all familiar with the concept of flight simulators that pilots use to learn how to fly a plane um, or to keep their skills sharp. So NASA kind of uh, you know, realized they needed to do something like this to train the astronauts as well as the flight control team. But in the early days of flight simulation for space, they had to figure out how to do this before anybody had been to space. To me, that sounds like a great challenge, and I'd love to talk with Dick and ask him to come up here and uh, we can chat a little bit about the challenges that you had. So 
from Iowa, University of Dubuque, working with NASA. Uh, I grew up in Davenport um, in, in the late 1940s and early 50s. Um, uh, at that time, Davenport was a pretty quiet place, I think. And we seemed to, uh, to be, we used to, uh, the boys would go around riding their bicycle all over town. I had two uncles who had dairy farms north of town. And I just loved when I was in junior high to go out there, when they were, especially when they were working in the field, I could ride a tractor and uh, tie wires on a hay baler back when they had manual fire ties. And had automatic paper and so forth. Uh, I did read uh, that before when I was in high school that we should have a, a broad education. And so in high school, I took every elective I could, uh, besides the normal ones like uh, playing geometry, physics, chemistry. I took uh, a semester of physiology, a semester of psychology, electricity graphic arts, and so forth. And then I went to the University of Dubuque. Uh, my chemistry teacher, he encouraged me to go to Knox College over in Illinois, but I knew some friends at NMD that were over, already up at the University of Dubuque, so I went up there. Majored in uh, mathematics, double major in mathematics and economics. And I graduated, didn't know what I wanted to do. And uh, I decided, well, Maybe I ought to get over the idea that I should uh, get the military work out of the way. So I applied to the Navy, and they didn't take me. So then I came back home, thought about some more. So I went back to Des Moines and enlisted in the Army, and they took me. So uh, after basic training out in Colorado, uh, a group of us uh, were on a train down to Fort Bliss. Uh, in El Paso, Texas. That was the Army's Air Defense Command. And we were all put in school, and we, uh, the school on uh, any aircraft got it in us. And that was about the most practical thing I could have ever had. The military training is operational, it's not about design. But it sure did uh, talk a lot about systems and how they operate. Uh, that, we went to school like that for uh, about a year, and that's 40 hours a week for school. Uh, not a lot of homework, but it should it shut the work I mean, it should be information. Um, then there was another period uh, while I was still in service, I was in the office where they were working with computers. It was an IBM 650 computer, one of the was back into the computer, had a big drone memory. And uh, I just learned the very basic, I wasn't there very long, but I did learn some basics about uh, um, how you put together instructions for the computer, punching the cards, collating them, running them back through, and starting the program. Um, After I left, I, I had, I, I was, uh, well, before that, actually, I thought I'd better do something about getting a job. So I, uh, uh, there was a booklet in, in the day room, Derek's day room, and it was uh, every company that you could think of had a page, and in the back was basically a form you filled out, which was very big with a resume. And that's I had one of those pages. So I filled it out and sent it in. And, and I, just before I left uh, the Army, I got this call from a guy named Chris Kreutzis. And he was uh, working at Space Cash in Virginia. And this was 1960. And he asked me, uh, are you familiar with this, uh, this country's manned space program? And I thought, what I had seen was all these Atlas missiles just blowing up and they all fire right off the line. And I was thinking, well, this has got to be some future program. That could probably be good to get with. I could learn something. So uh, I said yes, which was probably the best lie I ever told. <laughs> uh, 
but he said, well, fill out an application, and, and so I did, and then nothing happened, I came back home, and uh, after a few days, he called me in, and he said, well, you're sure hard to keep up with, and he said, have you, ever, have you received the offer, and we sent you, I said, no, I had to come to the mail yet. By the way, what is it? And he said, $6,345 a year, which then was, I thought that was great. Now, you guys are going to graduate in two years, you're going to probably get about 10 times <laughs> But, uh, so I had a job, and uh, I said I'd take the offer on the phone, and a few days later, the offer came. Uh, he told me, well, we're at uh, Langley Field, Virginia, do you think you, you know where it is? And I said, yeah, I think so. I know where Virginia is. So I looked it up on a map and I drove out there and started my work. So very shortly after you got to Langley, you ended up down at Cape Canaveral. And you told me a story when the first day that you got there that uh, Harold Miller took you on a tour, and just I thought that that was a fun story. Well, yeah, well, the, my first day, uh, uh, after going through all the administrative stuff with what health insurance and everything you have, uh, they said, we'll go over this building over here, and uh, the first guy that I met uh, was Chris Kraft. They said, wait in his office, and he'll, he's in the meeting, he'll come meet you, so sure. So I, I looked at and around his office and I saw in front of his desk it was an 8 by 10 picture of an Atlas missile blowing up. So they had this in their mind all the time they were working as a reminder they had these reminders. Anyway, uh, they sent me down to the end of the hall and they said, in this big room with all these people with all these desks, there's a little room in the corner. And we'll leave with this group of guys. And they're, they're uh, that was a control center simulation group. And they, our job was uh, to run the exercises uh, for the market control center and the network. Uh, after a couple of times uh, down there, uh, uh, I stayed with uh, Carl Huss, and who's one of the names you'll find in the last part of the book, Hidden Figures. Uh, those people came from the Flight Research Division at the Langley Research Center. And they were, they told me about times um, when they were, um, the time when they were out at Edwards Air Force Base when we broke, this was 13 years ago, when we first broke the sound here. And I was thinking, I was 24 years old, about as naive, naive as you can be at that age. And, I was thinking, my, my goodness, am I working with these kind of people? Uh, but anyway, Harold Miller was one of the other members of the group. Carl and I used to share a hotel room when we went down to Cape Canaveral. So they took me, they took me around and showed me the cave and went on up to the roof of the IP Impact Predictor 709 building, which was the which was the computer at the Cape that, that uh, took all the radar inputs in and uh, computed the impact of all the uh, spacecraft when they didn't work. Uh, and uh, we were just talking and I said, boy, you know, it's sure is sink or swim around here. And he said, yeah, we don't have time to teach you how to swim. And that's the way it was. It was and the next day, Nine years was uh, uh, like drinking water out of the fire hose. It, it was, and it was exciting, that's for sure. So the idea of the simulations were to not only train the astronauts, but to train the flight control team as well. And because you know the flight controllers were going to be so integral in helping the astronauts figure out what they needed to do if there was a problem. They had to work through every problem and, and figure out what the problem was. So your job as the simulator team was to think of 
all these problems that could possibly happen. And the, I think some people thought that you guys were crazy, that you were diabolical, that you were thinking about all these crazy things that they thought could never happen. But the, the crazy thing was that a lot of them did happen, things that you guys thought of. And I, I think um, I'll ask you about maybe the most challenging or most uh, important simulation that you ended up doing right before the Apollo launch. Uh, yes, the computer alarm simulation. Uh, to give you a little background, uh, we had about a 75 day period of simulations. And for Apollo, when we started this on Apollo 8, we uh, centered our simulations around each of the maneuvers at the launch, launch, translator interjection, mid-course directions, lunar orbit insertion, uh, and in the case of Apollo 11, it would be uh, landing, and then ascent and rocket, and then transfer interjection. <coughs> so we had a simulation, so in all those days, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, in the simulations that had fit in the 75 day period,
So they had to talk about that some more. And finally, Kranz gave them direct direction to uh, research that and get together with MIT Draper Labs who built all the software and everything for the computer. And, uh, and they had so they actually had people on site in Houston. So they went through it and through the program in arms and they built up a big list. I think uh, in Nancy's book, she has a picture of it. Uh, and so I hadn't heard anything about it since then until we got to the real flight. And we got to descent and we got a 1202 alarm, which was the one next to the one that we sent. And they went further into the descent and they got the 1201 alarm, the exact alarm that we simulated. And of course, since we simulated it and they did the research, uh, it didn't really, well, it caused some, you know, to think, but they decided, and they could decide that it was okay to pursue the lunar landing. And I think uh, during the simulation, uh, I remember th after the debriefing and everything, I remember thinking, uh, well, I guess we made a point. So they're going to research it. And we didn't hear anything about it. And then when they actually, we watched, uh, and it actually happened, we said, oh my God. And so uh, they didn't abort, of course. And there are things in your book that gave, I didn't even know anything about. Uh, I understood that there were, some of the things that caused the mind was the fact that they put the rendezvous in there with the lunar module uh, in operation at the time. And that might have caused it, but there are other considerations. Yeah, so if, if you're not familiar with the story, during the Apollo 11 landing, uh, the computer alarms started blaring and uh, if Dick and his team had not run that simulation just about two weeks before the Apollo 11 launch, uh, I think uh, the flight controllers would not have been familiar, familiar with the computer alarm and they very well could have called it aboard during the actual Apollo 11 landing. And so what we think of Apollo 11 could have ended up very differently in history as, as opposed to what we think of it today. That's possible. Well, you have to remember, though, that the pilot has a seat in his pants. <laughs> and he probably would not have reported. That's what they say now. That's what Fred A. said, I think, recently. But I think I've got to be a little bit cautious about taking that much credit for it. All right. We're, uh, I'm going to give you one last question just to ask uh, what are some of your What's a favorite memory of uh, your work during Apollo? Well, I think Apollo 8 it took a lot of us. Uh, Apollo 8 was a magical mission. It was clean. It didn't have any decent on to go around the moon or anything like that. But uh, the first uh, flight after the, the Apollo fire, with the redesigned spacecraft was a, occurred in October. Uh, earlier in August, uh, it was decided because the lunar module was not uh, making its schedule, that they think if the flight in October will be okay, it will go okay, that they go around the moon with this train service with the Apollo so they got a team of us together, somebody from every area, flight, flight planning, uh, flight activities planning, uh, the flight trajectory people, uh, the systems people, and I was on that team uh, for the simulation. So we had to put together the first time the whole sequence of uh, simulations that had fit into this 75 day period of schedule that we had. Uh, and I think uh, the way it went, it went so well, then capping it off with reading from Genesis on uh, Christmas Eve. Uh, that was quite, a, uh, besides that, uh, we came home after the crew went to sleep. And I came home, it was Christmas Eve, of course, so our uh, 
daughter was five years old. His daughter was five years old. And he had to put her bicycle together to put under the tree. <laughs> and didn't do it quietly enough. So she came down the stairs, sent poor old Santa Claus in here. So we all had Christmas about two in the morning. <laughs> Oh, that's a wonderful story. Uh, we're going to give you the opportunity to uh, answer some other questions too, but I'm going to call up some of the uh, professors and researchers here at the University of Iowa and we're going to talk a little bit about the, the history and the future of, of space exploration and astronomy. So if I could ask the uh, other members to come up, please. I can show you how. And I said to him, 
I don't want to show you how, but I'm going to figure it out. <laughs> so I eventually. So like, uh, like George, I was too young to really remember the Apollo mission, so that wasn't a, a formative thing for me. Um, I'm more a child of the shuttle era, so I, I thought the space shuttle was really amazing and uh, incredible. But uh, that's not really what got me into the job that I have today. Um, instead, I'm going to say pretty much the same thing as Craig. I can blame it on science fiction. Um, specifically, I read a lot of science fiction, and I, I picked up a book by, by Carl Sagan. I uh, really liked it, and then started reading some of his popular science books, and uh, uh, that's uh, how I ended up where I am today. Uh, what are some of the important milestones that led to the work that you're doing now and the research you're doing of uh, milestones in both uh, a larger realm of space exploration, like technology development or that kind of things, as well as, as personal milestones, if you'd be willing to share those? Well, for me, probably. The biggest milestone is that the work I'm doing currently was sort of discovering the radiation belts by James Van Allen. Since uh, uh, I'm the principal investigator for a mission to make measurements in the radiation belts, actually, it just stopped Monday because uh, they've got to run out of fuel. But for the last seven plus years, we've been measuring in those radiation belts the best uh, measurements ever made. Um, so that, that for me was you know, kind of a coming back home here at Iowa. Uh, for a long time, the other thing that was for me personally very satisfying was that I in the world of workouts. And so for most of my early career, I uh, um, flew what are called sounding rockets. These are so orbital rockets. And, uh, and several of them flying over and through the Aurora and the northern latitudes. Uh, and those are just really spectacular. So, uh, you know, people sometimes ask, and it doesn't spoil it to know the science line, but, but beautiful things like that are. And I always tell them, though, I'm back to the hands of it because I understand how it works. I I had a kind of interesting story of how I ended up here. Uh, my mom was actually a secretary in the building, and when I came to college, one of her bosses offered me a job by somewhere after my freshman year. I, didn't know what, I wanted to do something science. I always loved science, astronomy, engineering, and I NASA. Uh, and I started moving computer tapes. Back in those days, we got all our data from you know, the giant computers that took up whole rooms in the building. We had a whole warehouse full of computer tapes. My job was to drive an old Air Force truck back and forth between the physics building and this warehouse with all the computer tapes that scientists wanted. And then when I got done with my undergrad, I even still didn't know what I wanted to do. I had a physics degree, but I decided to go to grad school here because I love space and that's what they're doing. So that's what I started doing. Uh, after I graduated, I started working on the CD project and got to go down to the Cape. Uh, in Apple for a couple of years and we were testing it. It was the best, probably the best time in life. Just like in the Apollo program, we were working, you know, 60 hours, 80 hours a week to get the instrument built. But you just did it because you loved what you were doing and, uh, you know, being able to drive around the base. That was way before 9 11, so we had badges and we were allowed to drive anywhere on the base, go up and show a pad. And it was just the best time in my life. Uh, well, uh, I swear I didn't look at uh, Craig's crib sheet before this, but uh, since, since we're sitting in Van Allen Hall, I don't think it's too inappropriate that a few of us mentioned Van Allen. Uh, you know, he's really the, the reason that we all have the careers that we do today, because he was the first person to show that you could launch a relatively simple scientific experiment into space and make big discoveries, and uh, that's ultimately what we're still doing here. We're building relatively simple experiments, but we're sending them to places and learning about our universe. I'm going to ask uh, each of you um, on any insights that you have on the early days of space exploration, and I'm going to ask Dick to answer this too, uh, how, kind of how everything has evolved to the present day. Is there a specific event or discovery that stands out to you that really uh, has enabled the exploration space that we can do today? Well, I think it's a, a steady evolution. I mean, certainly the whole manned space flight program in the 60s, which was parallel with uh, putting satellites in what we call robotic missions, have uh, just steadily improved over the years. I think um, probably one of the biggest changes in my career as we go forward is uh, the shrinking of the sizes of satellites and being able to find multiple satellites with identical instruments at the same time. 
Uh, this first started in about the 2000 plus commission, which was doing the NASA European Space Agency. Um, and that's really been kind of a game changer, uh, increasingly for the mission to be too, because uh, it's sort of almost like you know, putting on glasses after you know, you've had this look blurry for a while, and you get you know, a much clearer picture. So I think the, uh, the just sort of the very steady evolution of technology it really seems like it's taken off in the last few years. I'll agree with uh, Professor Fletzing and also just uh, explore one with Dr. Van Allen, the ability of uh, basically a you know, university in Iowa to build the first scientific instrument to fly in space and make the first you know, discovery, scientific discovery in space age. It just continued on and you know, this department continues to build instruments and it's allowed me you know, to get a PhD and do the things I love in space, uh, build instruments that kind of built Jupiter and Saturn. Actually, I'm going to merge my answer to this one with your last one. The thing that strikes me you know, in the stories about the Apollo is how we don't know what people are. And uh, when I first got into space research in the, the late 80s, early 90s, almost everyone building stuff was 10 to 15 years older than me because they all started about that time. And the, the big development that's actually enabled my recent research is this HaloSat CubeSat, which is a, a satellite that's only, it's about 30 pounds and would actually fit in your carry-on luggage, um, is the fact that everyone who worked on that mission but me is about 10 to 20 years younger than me. So the, 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 the really big thing in the field that has developed what I'm doing now is the fact that uh, you know, the miniaturization of electronics has been enabled satellites that are just as capable as the ones NASA has been building at very low cost and very small sizes. And it's allowed young people to get back into the field and really make big contributions. So some of the you know, graduate students in my lab literally like coded the boards and uh, you know, the, all the work was done on the instrumentation in this building, people soldering it, people who had no experience doing space stuff before. So to me, it's very exciting because the big thing about the problem is the excitement of all the young people involved at the time. The young people were making the decisions, doing all the important work, and with the small side of the revolution, we've been able to get back to them. Yes, I, um, I think, you know, with Mercury, everything was analog. Uh, it was ground guided, the, 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 the launch vehicle was ground guided. Uh, uh, the Redstone, or the, uh, I think the Juno or Explorer, I think they just had dialogues and autopilot. Uh, and, then, and then when we moved into Gemini and Apollo, uh, the, the spacecraft got very much more complicated. They had onboard computers and guidance. Uh, the Apollo computers we had a sextant and, and a telescope that worked uh, from the stars, and the crew could autonomously uh, turn their flight path and so forth. Uh, and I know that because the, in simulation, uh, it, we had to have a digital computer, and, and in the Mission Control Center, that's the computer we use. Uh, we started out with 7094s, and then we went to 360. Every time IBM would come out uh, with a new, faster computer, it went into that machine control center. Uh, the increase in, in communications and, and, and computing uh, over those years was amazing. And still, you know, when you have on your cell phone, it's, it's amazing. see as uh, the legacy of Apollo and how should that legacy guide us forward in exploring space? Well, for me, um, the manned space program is, is less about science, I mean, it does some science, than it is about um, sort of what we are as humans that we always are trying to reach for something further out. I mean, it's a part of civilization. If we stop trying to go places we haven't been before and, and do something we haven't done before, and I get very worried about uh, the whole human race and what's going on. So to me, what, what Apollo showed was that we continue to have that spirit as a, as a civilization. And uh, we have to keep going in that direction. So I think this continual reaching, um, I'm a big fan of that, going back to the moon, going 
staying there for a while, uh, not quite as short as this last time. And I think ultimately we will get to the planets. That's a very big challenge. Uh, getting to a place like Mars is not quite as simple as it sounds. Uh, actually, even staying on the moon for a long time is not all that simple as it sounds. Um, many people aren't aware that uh, the moon is covered by regolith, which is essentially like shards of glass. Um, and nothing rounds them off like sand and oceans and things. So, uh, on a couple of moon walks, and they got concerned about whether they were going to be able to zip up their spacesuits properly because of damage to the zippers. Uh, so there's lots of little, little things like that, that that we have to keep working on. Uh, but nonetheless, I think humans will eventually spread further out into space, and uh, we'll keep on going as far as we can. Yeah, basically the same thing. Just going places, you know, the far east, just like Kennedy said in his speech about climbing mountains the tallest mountains. It's just going out, doing something that hasn't been done, exploring new places. Uh, that's what Apollo means to me. Uh, well, that'll all call my moon landing story. <laughs> just, Nancy pointed out the Apollo mission was invented as a way to beat the Russians. And um, I already mentioned that my mom's finished. And I was actually in Finland one week shy of my seventh birthday, visiting the country for the very first time watching the moon landing in my grandmother's apartment on a screen that was smaller, about the size of my home, about smaller than most people's iPhones are these days, with everyone from the neighborhood gathered around because she was the only one who owned this type of black and white television. And Finland shares a border with Russia, so you would think that they would be really into beating Russians. But when we watched that landing, the one that Nancy showed at the very beginning, the, the feeling in the room was just one of achievement, one of, you know, you know, humanity can really do this. Not that we're beating the Russians, just that humanity can do this and then really bring everybody together. So I think that's the big legacy of the Apollo program. And that's what I hope would be the legacy of exploration going forward. So to me, uh, the legacy of Apollo is showing what we can do if we all pull together, um, what we're capable of if we really put our resources toward it and make a concerted effort something. Um, pardon me. Unfortunately, I think to, to some degree NASA has, has lost its way, uh, and, and right now we're not all pulling in the same direction and we're not accomplishing the amazing things that we did in the Apollo era. Uh, we are to some degree in science. There's a lot of great things going on in science, but in, in exploration, uh, we don't have a very consistent uh, goal now for NASA. And just as uh, the reason that the Apollo program worked out so well is because of politics, the reason NASA is having trouble right now is politics. Uh, every four years, we have uh, a new set of marching orders on NASA, uh, and uh, there's an obvious uh, reason for that. It has to do with politics. Uh, but uh, you know, I'm uh, the baby on the panel here. But even I've been uh, around NASA long enough to see the moon go in and out of fashion about three times um, in the last 20 years. We've been going back to the moon, and, and then we weren't. And then we were going to go to Mars, and then we weren't. And uh, then we were going to go to an asteroid, and now we're going to the moon again. And, uh, so I, I hope that um, one of these days we can all co coalesce around a, a common goal again, uh, and NASA can be what it was again in the Apollo era. Yeah, I would say, uh, not so much the technical achievement, but uh, the unity that NASA had uh, through that program. I mean, it's easy to say, yes, that uh, it's quite a, a goal that certainly captures the human imagination. Anybody would be, and that would unite everybody. But NASA had to go through, as you would agree, Nancy's book, many, many problems that were self-inflicted, I have to say. Yeah, but uh, you know, take, for example, the, the Apollo fire. Previous to that, North America objected to a, a total atmosphere, uh, oxygen atmosphere and space gap. NASA refused to, to do that in the implementation of uh, space gap. Uh, yet after the fire occurred, North America just you know, basically sucked it up and, and made the changes that needed to be changed. And they stayed with the program. And you find that with any of the problems that Nancy talked about in the book, uh, NASA at that time, uh, basically they forget. Uh, there, there's all these problems. You can trace back to some human 
poor decision or, or, or some sort of mistake, and uh, they stayed with the program and then made it on time. So let's look at the future a little bit, and uh, based on all of your expertise, uh, what do you anticipate and hope that the future of exploration will look like? Um, what are the sort of scientific questions that that are important to you that might motivate future missions? Well, I think uh, one of the big things for the future is uh, sort of the evolution in the last really five, ten years of our ability to launch things. Um, particularly the last five years, the whole story about what kind of rockets we have, and possible rockets in particular, uh, to get into space, it, it's starting to fall dramatically. Um, this sort of started with SpaceX and it's continuing on with Rocket Lab and some of the other companies. Um, one of the great things for us in science is, um, as I like to say, you know, to be uh, in, in the cool kids club as a billionaire, you have to have a rocket company. And uh, I think that's great because these guys are investing and they're really showing there's some different ways to do things and drive costs down. And, and uh, um, it's, it's really kind of remarkable to see that. And I think what it's going to enable us to do, coupled with, uh, you know, as Bill was talking about, the small satellites, is to start putting up lots of satellites. I think one of the, the goals that we really have long term is to start to be able to predict with some degree of accuracy uh, effects of the sun on the uh, system around the Earth. And uh, there's lots of things we call space weather that cause problems in the back of the east. Uh, there's a big blackout in Canada because of these kind of effects. And so I think if we put those two things together, miniaturization of spacecraft and the ability to launch things for a lot less money, um, we're going to really start to get enough uh, points out there to monitor and start to be weather like here on the surface of the Earth. And going to science, I think the big uh, thing that NASA is looking at and is one of the prime goals is, is there other life in its uh, solar system or the universe? Uh, that's why we send all these missions to Mars and uh, we're going to send the Europa Clipper to uh, Jupiter's moon Europa. And a lot of scientists would like to send a mission to uh, Saturn and Enceladus because those are places where there is liquid water, it used to be liquid water, and the uh, way we understand life be water. And so has there ever been life there or is there life there now is a big thing. And if we do define life, you know, what does that mean for us on Earth uh, not to be the only uh, planet with life on it? I just want to get out there and do it. I mean that uh, we've been 30 years away from putting people on Mars for as long as I can remember. I'd like to see that uh, that they stop marching out into the future and start marching back towards us so that it can be something that happens in my lifetime. Uh, I guess my goal is astronomers always want bigger telescopes, so I'd love to have people in space to build them. <laughs> I actually don't think humans are very well suited to living in space. I'm not sure how well it's going to work out, but I think it's worth it. Good job. Yes, I think that was uh, something in the argument that Jim and Al had many years ago about the cost of putting humans in space. And I think that what, uh, as I see it, I'm not that close to what's really going on and we've got explosive work the past But I wonder if uh, maybe some of the robotics and the other missions have really developed uh, what they and shown what they can do, and they're more of a predecessor to what humans were. And humans would follow what you guys find. Uh, for example, uh, I was going to ask the question where are we in understanding the radiation effects uh, between here and going, going from here to Mars and, and the time? Or do we understand that? And Sure, I understand that problem, but I remember that on Apollo 15, uh, they were coming back, and, and the crew members noticed that uh, they're getting flashes. They can see the ring, which, which came, I understand it, from cosmic rays. That's what they're from. Who they're on. Are we, where are we on those kind of questions? Uh, 
I, I would say that um, we're halfway there with the answer to that question. We've, we've made the measurements that define what the radiation environment is. Um, what we don't yet understand is uh, how to protect people from that radiation environment. Uh, to my knowledge, that's still an unsolved problem. You know, people, people have ideas of you know, having a big reservoir of water if the astronauts hide inside when the, when the solar storm hits, but uh, those are still as much science fiction as science fact. I'd like to say another piece of that is our ability to predict when something like that is going to happen is extremely primitive. Um, so um, we don't know when to tell the astronauts this is going to go high. Um, so the two pieces need to come together. Yeah, because right now, uh, when something gets near the space station, they can do a certain amount of maneuvering the space station for the micro Rewrites uh, in the space station. And they can go into one of the other modules to protect themselves from it. Uh, well, I want to thank everybody for sharing your insights and your expertise on, uh, on our past, present, and, and future of space exploration. Uh, for me personally, I think that uh, Apollo, astronaut, Apollo 9 astronaut Rusty Schweiker wrote the foreword for my book, and I think that he summed up the Apollo program best when he said that Apollo was just ordinary people coming together to accomplish something truly extraordinary. And as a personal side note, I would say that wonderful people came together. Everyone that I interviewed uh, was just absolutely wonderful, and uh, I just, you know, they were salt, they are salt of the earth. Uh, down to earth people. And they really changed the course of history with the work that they did. Uh, I want to thank Dick for being here tonight and thank for all of the, the faculty member, members for being here and, and uh, sharing your expertise. Uh, we also wanted to give a chance for the audience to ask any questions if, if you have any. No questions? Okay, we got one minute. Any ideas for Europa? Uh, anything specific about Europa or water samples? Uh, why that's, the plan for the Europa Clipper, which is going to be an order of Europa, that NASA plans to launch in, I think, 2020 20 something, uh, is the, there has some evidence of Hubble observations that might be a plume on Europa that at once probably Europa erupts, basically shoots water into space. And they plan for Europa Clipper in the orbit, they hope to fly through this plume if there is, if it's there, and be able to measure if there's any organic uh, chemicals in the water that comes out. NASA also has talked about sending a lander to Europa uh, and actually land on the surface and either drill through the ice or sample the surface ice and look for. Uh, organic uh, compound. Uh, that was a little harder to do and it's not as far along. Uh, but th there are plans or people that hope to do that someday. And Celadus, the moon in Celadus Saturn, we know for a fact has plumes that shoots into space. In fact, Cassini flew through it. Unfortunately, Cassini did not have instruments specifically designed to look for these organic chemicals. The in instruments that they did have did take measurements that hinted or strongly hinted that some types of organic chemicals are present in the, in the plumes coming out. And so there are a number of scientists that would like to go back there and fly an instrument specifically designed to search for life uh, and fly it through the plumes since it's the one location we know there's water and we know we can sample it in space while they actually have to land and drill through the surface to get to the water. Yeah, just to back that up, Enceladus is a much better target because the plumes go all the time, but it's much harder to get into. Any other questions? Yes. yes. Uh, how do you feel about um, my very tail end of the stage generation? So I did see the 1969 landing, but now there's talk about private funding as opposed to public funding uh, space program. I would still like to see government
Saturn by deep are uh, substantially more difficult to do, not routine things, and at least at this juncture, there's no real, um, what would I say, proper motive to do so. It's more of a human striving and spirit wanting to know. So I think for those kinds of things, it's a measure of the category of basic research. Uh, governments are always going to have to fund that because you have to get things far along uh, so that uh, commercialization is now looks like a real possibility. And at this point, that's not happening with those kinds of targets in other places like the science. Uh, the flip side of that, though, is like the small satellites and things. Uh, you know, there's various constellations of satellites and all over the world. Uh, they're very much commercial, you know, uh, providing cell phone coverage in you know, remote parts of the world and things like that. So, uh, I think it's a, it's a balance. Oh, okay. I, I think you want us to be as of Mars <laughs> and satisfy us with the issues. And the big thing there is just because he, he apparently has the little question of whether or not he has enough money to do it. So, but the, in the private sector, Craig's completely correct that the, the main there doesn't seem to be a big private sector demand for the, the science research side. All the billionaires who are doing this are doing it to send humans, you know, deep into space. So I'm not sure any of the billionaires are interested in picking up, you know, multi-million dollar missions to, to the surface of Mars to see if there's life there. They want to send people there. I'll both. Okay, well, I think we'll wrap things up for this evening. Uh, again, I want to thank the, the University of Iowa for uh, inviting me here tonight. I thank Carolyn Roberts, thank you for coordinating everything. Uh, it was honored to sit up here and to, to meet all of you, uh, especially this is the first time that I actually got to meet Dick in person. We did interviews over the phone for the book, so this has been delightful for me. I do have copies available of my book for sale. I'll be up in the back there. They're $25, I'd be happy to sign them for you if you're, if you're going to be interested. Thank you so much. <laughs>